All righty, I think we are live. Howdy, howdy, folks. So we've got around 47 people in the in the stream, which is cool. So we're probably still uh, going to have a few people coming in and finding their virtual chairs. Oh, 48 now. So a few a few housekeeping things before we get into the presentation. Uh, there's a Q&A session. There's a Q&A. Uh, screen on the on the right hand side. If you don't see it, just put one of the little the arrow buttons that will kind of bring that out. In there, you have chat participants and Q and A. So if you do have any questions, please do ask them. You can upvote them as well. So I'll be having a look at um, at those uh, towards the end. And there is a raise hand function if you do have any technical issues or anything. But also, if you do have a question and you want to jump a video and audio and ask it, there is a raise hand as well. So we can bring it up to the virtual stage. And you can ask your question. Um, and if you and if you want to go back to the foyer during the presentation, use the link in the general chat. So without further ado, we'll introduce uh, the two speakers we've got coming up. So we've got Mo and we've got Danny. So Mo's from Ops. So he's uh, he's running the gamut of cyber security space. Uh, from penetration testing for Rapid Seven as a consultant, penetration testing numerous federal agencies, testing mobile applications for HP, contributing exploits to the Metasploit framework. Thank you very much for those contributions, Mo. We're, we're definitely going to be using a lot of those. Um, and then we have Danny as well. So he's from NetAlpha Financial Systems. And at age 20, Danny founded his own boutique company for innovative software and hardware solutions. And these two very handsome gentlemen will be talking through um, their presentation uh, from the ground Oh, from the cloud to the ground, rather. So I'm actually really interested to hear the uh, the technical aspect of these things. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you guys and um, let you guys share your screens for the presentation and away we go. Cool. Thank you for having us. Yeah. All right. So, um, like uh, we were introduced, I'm Danny, um, CTO of NetAlpha Financial Systems. This is Mo, um, co-founder of Ledger Ops. So, quick review of what we're going to talk about today. We came to this idea for this talk. Um, I came from more of a development and cloud architecture and some cloud pen testing background. Uh, modes more from the internal <clears throat> pen testing and we want to see how we can join forces and get a really nice tail chain from the cloud to the ground and that's what we're going to present today we're going to present a few techniques um, that we saw both for um, attacking clouds also a little bit of blue a bit of defensive and then from there we're going to get go into the internal through a couple of ways, uh, AD proxy and um, VPC peering, and just show how we jump from the cloud into the internal and then we get full ownage. Um, so for people who don't know about the shared responsibility model of the cloud, we have a couple of different ways we can use the cloud. We can use it as infrastructure as a service, which is basically you manage your own virtual machines you do not touch the physical networks, the um, servers, the hypervisors, but you do have to manage the virtual networks, the OS, your apps. So there's a lot more things to, um, to patch and to look at, out for. Then we go into the pass. Um, that's something, let's say you can use Fargate, which is a Dockerized, uh, Dockerized pass. So you just basically get your Docker containers, but you do not touch the OS, you don't touch the networks. And then there is the SaaS, or in the cloud, it's a lot of times it's um, serverless functions. So you basically just provide the code and the data. So for clouds, um, a few techniques to get the initial foothold. We always have the exploits uh, and exposed machines, different uh, vulnerabilities in web apps. And was pretty common, still pretty common in cloud as an SSRF and then grabbing credentials from the metadata server. So AWS actually released um, the Instance Metadata Server version two, which um, mitigates a lot of these uh, SSRF and different other ways to exploit and get the, the credentials. So if you're not using 
um, the version two, look look for that and try to migrate to it. So um, we're going to get an initial foothold pretty easily with the um, pickle bomb, um, which is a deserialization attack for Python. And we're going to do this on salary workers. We're going to get a, a put a new message in a queue, in a Redis queue for an exposed Redis. And when one of the salary workers will grab it, we'll um, get a shell. So we pushed our message into the queue. And then on the right, we can see that we have the cat running and let's get some data from the metadata server. So we get the user data, which is a startup script. A lot of times people leave keys in there um, to grab data from other services, sometimes keys for GitHub to grab the latest version of the software it's supposed to run. And we're gonna get some credentials. So first we got the role, which is the EC2 instance role. So, and now we're gonna get a fresh set of credentials, which we can actually grab them and use them from our local machine and basically impersonate that machine with AWS services. This is the small script I wrote to um, do this attack. It's pretty simple. Second thing we'll go through is service mesh poisoning. So we're going to be using new technologies for old tricks. And like any poisoning trick, here I'm going to focus on um, HashiCorp console, which is a, it's a great service mesh and service discovery framework. I've been using it for a while. It has a great community. So um, service discovery. When we work in a microservice oriented architecture, our services need to know which services are available, how to contact them, um, get their IP address, get different versions. So that's what service discovery basically does. We register a service, it goes into this, um, it's a decentralized um, distributed uh, data store, key value store that has, stores all our services, metadata, some tags, and then we also get a service mesh capability. So we get identity-based authorization. We get L7 traffic management. Um, easy way to do sidecar proxies with TLS encryption. So this is what it looks like in the console. We can see we have two console servers, two Postgres servers, one Sentry, two Sentry, and four vaults. And we can either query the console agent, like the first line, which is console catalog services, or we can um, do a did request and do postgres.services console. And we can see we get two IPs returned to us. So those are the two Postgres services that are running in our network. So let's see how we can do the poisoning. We're gonna impersonate a service on a compromised machine. So when we have a machine that um, runs, let's say a Python web server service and it registers it, if the, if uh, the, um, the setup does not have proper or very good identity management um, and access controls, then we can basically register another service. It doesn't check if it's actually a Postgres server running or whatever you're trying to run. So you basically just give it a name. And if the name already exists in console, it'll route some of the traffic to your service as well. So this is a, a JSON format and an HCL file. HCL is the HashiCorp um, language. It's pretty, um, it's pretty easy to use. So we have the ID, we have the name, uh, the port, and then last thing that we can also exploit is the health checks can be arbitrary command. So this has been bash and user imagination every, every minute. So we're gonna move the file into the console folder and do a hot reload. Another way of doing this, since 
a lot of uh, services are Docker containers. So there's this tool called Registrator. So it automatically registers and deregisters services for any Docker container. So it basically sits in your Docker as a container in the same um, host, and it will um, periodically scan to see if any new containers came up and any other containers came down and update that update your um, service mesh based on that. So this is even riskier. So even if we do have um, good controls and access controls, registry will still have a token. So if we are able to run a Docker container, it will register it because it has the permission to do it. So what we're gonna do is we'll start a new container, call it Postgres, and it'll register as a Postgres service and some of the traffic will be routed to us. So um, by utilizing a feature and the authentication feature in Postgres, we can, if we can man in the middle it, we can ask the host, the, the client to send us the credentials in plain text and basically ha, ha, like make a hash from it like the real server would do and send it to the um, to a database. So it's transparent, the database think it's doing a proper authentication, but our man in the middle server is able to request the credentials in plain text from the client and it will give it to them. So we're gonna utilize this by registering a new Postgres service um, with our proxy in there. So we'll get that running on the right side, which is Python proxy pi. And then on the left side, we're just gonna make few connection attempts to the real, uh, to the to one of the Postgres service. So we're using in the host, we're using um, postgres.service.console. As you can see on the right side, we grab the username, um, we grab the, the password, we have the salt, and here's the hashed password with the salt. So we can forward that to the real database and establish a connection. Um, and we just stole um, credentials, no need to track anything. We have plain text, username and password. So after we're already in the cloud, we grab some credentials. Um, how do we stay there? How do we hide and make ourselves persistent and be able to grab a fresh set of credentials? Because even if um, one of the attacks was detected, usually the first thing to do is to revoke the credentials from the machine. So um, we need to find a way to get a fresh set of credentials and basically hide in plain sight. So Lambda layers, um, Lambda functions, so, um, there are serverless functions. And what we can do with them is um, we can get a Lambda layers. So Lambda layers basically give us the ability to package a lot of the dependencies we use in different functions and put them in a layer and then reuse this layer in different functions. So if you have an API or a big um, database, a big uh, folder with database models that you reuse them, it's pretty common to use Lambda layers. So, and Lambda layers are packaged, depends on uh, if you're using Node.js, Python, Java, they'll basically um, all be packaged into the libraries. So either like the NPM, the NPM modules, or in Python, the lib folder. And we can override like known libraries. So this is what I'm, I'm gonna show. I'm gonna, I forked the Python request module, which a lot of, I mean, it's really used. So um, we can assume that a lot of functions might use that. So I over, I got into the request function and basically, added another line to it that will take all the environmental variables and send them to my server every time there's a request. And this is my listener on my server. It will 
take those environmental variables and give me the access key, um, the secret key, session token, security token, and also the data um, that was sent to that Lambda function. And in the Lambda function, once the layer is loaded, just do an import request, regular thing to do, and do a regular get request. And let's see how that works. So we're going to invoke the Lambda function that's on the right with a curl. And we're going to have our listener um, on the left. So there we go. We've got a fresh set of credentials with a session token. And if we do this again, we'll get another set. Don't try to use it. They're evoked. Um, yeah, we can get a constant flow of credentials. So I've done it. It was not detected. I will talk about um, infrastructure as code, which actually helps detect um, things like this. But a lot of times um, what happens is that since there are so many layers, um, it's pretty easy to add an, a new version for a layer. So we can pull a layer that exists, see what's in it, take it, basically um, duplicate it, and make our changes and upload that as the new version of the layer. And when um, infrastructure as code is not implemented, it's very hard to see those subtle changes. So I'm going to hand this over to Mo now. to unmute yourself there, Mike. Thank you. So we're going to do a quick uh, AD 101. Um, so Active Directory is used uh, by majority of organizations to manage, uh, you know, their systems and, and enterprise environments running Windows. Um, and it, effectively, it's a directory service database. And LDAP is the primary protocol that's used to communicate with um, Active Directory. Um, the vulnerability that we're actually going to leverage for for pivoting from the external to the internal um, is uh, something that was identified by the by the uh, fine team over at preempt um, great research that they do um, they've done incredible things in the past couple of years and um, hats off to them um, they've identified a vulnerability um, within adfs um, which adfs for those who don't know it's a single sign-on solution created by microsoft um, it's effectively an adfs proxy host is tip is a host that um, will allow a you know, let's say systems that you want um, to communicate on the outside um, externally to communicate with systems internally without being communicate uh, without being connected to them. So it, it allows those services um, to, to communicate um, without a direct connection to your organization's internal network, which is um, ideal. This is, you know, good, good job, Microsoft. Now, the problem here is that um, ADFS supports uh, Windows integrated authentication. And um, this, unfortunately, due to this vulnerability that was identified, um, it was, WIA was not protected correctly. And um, it allowed protocols to be abused from externally. Um, so effectively an attacker can launch a brute force attack. And um, the way this was implemented allowed the attacker to circumvent an extranet's lockout policy. So either it was fail open or fail lock where all the accounts would be locked out. So um, you do you know, some simple reconnaissance, you find out an organization's um, email, first initial, last name, or first 
um, first name, last uh, initial, whatever that policy, uh, that naming convention is, um, and you now have a list of usernames and you can start um, you know, effectively just running massive dictionary attacks without ever locking, uh, without, without ever um, locking the user account, or you're going to lock out all the accounts, um, but it was one or the other um, as a result of this um, you know, flaw that was identified. So as a result, you're, you know, as an attacker, you, you know, let's say an organization has an eight character password policy, um, doing countless um, internal pen tests in my, you know, career, Um, even with a strong password policy in place, you're, you you know, the best I've seen is, um, you know, a lot of organizations are, their their people are using elite speak. Um, so lead speak dictionaries are for the win. Um, so, you know, we, we now have our, um, we've, we've compromised an account and we are able to sleep with one wife. get in um, one baby and we'll share this slide uh, with okay. everyone because I don't think the video is going to render correctly, but we now have a, an account and a foothold. <laughs> so, um, you know, ADFS proxy in this environment was used for, um, you know, typically used for SharePoint or Exchange. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, we we basically used it to circumvent the lockout policy. And um, the end result, um, Danny uh, basically was able to, before Microsoft released the patch, he implemented a quick fix um, that would is essentially put rate limiting. Um, so one you know, liner. <laughs> one liner there. <laughs> so we have our foothold. Uh, we we have our uh, account. Um, let's say we you know identify a VPN um, or Citrix Gateway, whatever that may be. We we're logged into um, in in we have access to your internal organization. Let's say uh, we're using VPN and we're logged in. Um, so. A quick run rundown. A um, whole bunch of different ways to to destroy an organization's internal environment um, before you finish your coffee. Um, uh, one of the items that I'm going to discuss is you know something that I've been constantly battling um, with throughout my career has just been how much trust is implement is based on what vulnerability scanners are telling people. Um, all the vulnerabilities that we're going to identify that that we're leveraging are of the info low and medium variety. Um, there's been a lot of talk about PowerShell being dead. Um, it's been resurrected as of late. Uh, the Empire Project has gotten a, 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 you know, has been revived, um, but I like to perform, I like to kind of use the new stuff. So I'm a big fan of using, um, you know, .NET, um, Install Shield. We're gonna dis- discuss different undetectable payloads, different C2s and C3s. Um, bypassing NTLM relay mitigations, um, you know, we're, we don't need shells, um, but they're, you know, they're way more fun. So hopping in internally, just a quick scan. Um, and, you know, we're just going to do a quick enumeration for null sessions. Um, null sessions are great because this allows us to basically enumerate an AD. Um, in this case, we, we have credentials could, so we can actually enumerate what's in Active Directory. We're going to look for SMB signing disabled. Um, SMB signing disabled is is a is a you know allows us to perform relay attacks. It's uh it's only been around for about twelve years or so, but they're typically categorized as medium findings, but they're highly effective because when you do exploit a system using relay attacks, you do have system privileges. Um, we're going to look for anonymous shares. Anon- anonymous shares are besides the obvious of accessing what's uh, on the share, you can also upload uh, malicious uh, SCF files, which then you can combine with uh, Responder to obtain net NTLM hashes of users um, who just automatically, who every time they go to that share, they're automatically going to th- authenticate to you. And as a result, you'll get their net NTLM hash, which then you can actually crack. Um, and the, our scan is going to look for effectively those items and for uh, you know, system that that is uh, listening on for on LDAP, which is going to you know tell us, okay, here's here's a domain controller, um, majority of the time. So a quick rundown of the 
SMB relay attack. Um, and you know, this is kind of like the quick one-on-ones. Um, and we're gonna get into a little bit more of the juicier stuff later. But um just a quick diagram because everybody loves diagram. Um and we're going to uh you know enable WPAT spoofing and um and relay authentication requests um that uh when you couple with responder or MITM6, um you can basically relay um let's say user a um attempts to tar uh, to authenticate to user b or they were to attempt to access a website on your internal then what you're effectively getting is um their authentication attempt is going to be relayed to a list of targets that have smb signing disabled um and that's if, what i'm going to be doing in that attack is i'm going to be you know, authenticating to every system that has SMB signing disabled. And the moment that that system that that user has um, admin privileges on any of those boxes, then I'm going to run secret stump um, and, you know, look for clear text, grab their hashes, all the good stuff. Um, so, you know, you may ask yourself, what if mitigation such as SMB signing is enabled or they have EPA? Well, there's a vulnerability in that as well. Um, so 2019-1040 allows you to bypass uh, message integrity controls and NTLM authentication. So if you were to fire up NTLM Relay X and, and use a remove MIC flag, um, that allow you to exploit that particular vulnerability. So um, you know even if the system has SMB signing enabled, you're still going to um, compromise that system, um, assuming that patch isn't installed. So as I mentioned, the remote code execution results with system privileges, which is, you know, everything. Um, and, uh, you know, your typical post exploitation routine, um, you know, which we really won't cover because that's a whole nother talk, um, will allow you to get to, you know, domain admin privileges. Um, if you were to couple this attack with a priv exchange attack, you, you have, you'll have instant um, domain admin um so another cool uh attack vector that was identified by dirk um dirk john he's a exceptional security researcher hats off to to dirk um he was able to identify you know a part of this vulnerability was that you know you can take uh any type of uh ntlm authentication and typically in a normal um in, in what you know the way that it's designed is you're not supposed to be able to modify um you know cross protocol authentication but um the vulnerability that he identified would allow you to relay let's say smb to to ldap um so a couple of bugs res resulted um, as a result of that, and even patches that were implemented by Microsoft were um, were, were found to be flawed. Um, and you know, the team at Preempt also found um, two to three different additional uh, vulnerabilities as a result of those patches being released. So um, definitely look into that. It's very very interesting. Uh, and so, you know, another attack scenario that we're we're going to look at would be to to get hosts to um, authenticate. Um, to us um, in order to relay their authentication attempts. So using any Active Directory account, you could just effectively connect via SMB to an Exchange server and you trigger the uh, spool service bug. Um, for Exchange server, what uh, we'll connects back to us via SMB and then we relay that authentication attempt to LDAP um, and we're using relayed authentication to grant DC sync and we're dumping all the hashes. <laughs> so, um, you know, this this also works in Kerberos as well. Um, you really, you're relaying LDAP over TLS to create a machine account um, and you're running the printer bugs um, against an, another domain controller. And that results in relayed connections, creating a computer account, which then we can use to impersonate a DA account. We can also pillage AD um, and, using that impersonating ticket we're going to run secret stump um, against the domain controller so that's another attack vector um so you're going to ask yourself okay what if we're testing an organization that has um you know lmnr mbt mdns um you know protection um from from you know layer two attacks well the you know 
and they even have, let's say, SMB signing enabled um, with the latest packet patches, well, then we're, we're going to go after, go after IPv6. So MITM6 um, is a tool that's released by Foxit, and it can be used to perform the same type of relay attack. Um, and the best part is, is that it, it's, you know, going after DNS6, which a lot of organizations aren't really even monitoring uh, IPv6. Even to this day, they're still not monitoring, and a lot of products aren't uh, monitoring IPv6. So you're you're effectively, you know, gain, gaining the same type of uh, you know attack vector as a responder attack would, and it goes unnoted, uh, noticed in a lot of organizations. So um, you know, one of the attack vectors right here you'll see um, is how we can leverage MITM6 to pop a domain controller. And then you run Secret Slump, one of my favorite tools. Uh, thank you, Impacket. And uh, this is a new vulnerability that was uh, released uh, four days ago. So uh, noted, no, known as zero login. Um, so you get instant domain access by subverting um, net login cryptography. So um, effectively, the vulnerability lies in um, you know net login sets the initialization vector to to fix value of 16 bits so we can actually um typically in in around 256 um iterations are able to identify the the value that we need to to um, impersonate any computer including the domain controller and then we're executing and remoting uh rpc calls on on their behalf so once we do that we're going to change um the machine account on that domain controller uh, to password that's a null. And then we run DC sync plus secret dumps. And now we just pop the, the um, DC. And this is, um, I mean, this is very, very critical. I wouldn't recommend doing this on a pen test as, as of right now, because it does cause the DC to go offline um, as, it, as a result of the password being changed and it's not able to communicate with other DCs. Now there is a new POC out that does revert um, the password of the DC back. Um, so that's that's helpful. But since this is fairly, this is only, you know, four or five days old, um, it's, you know, I would, I would keep this in your back pocket um, unless you're testing an environment that's um, very, very redundant. So moving on, um, this is kind of one of my little weapons of mass destruction um, that I like to call it, where I would fire off. Um, and, you know, these are smash and grab pen tests. These are not, you know, month long red teaming engagements or two month long red teaming engagements. So um, here we're coupling responder with MITM6 with NTLM Relay X. We're pointing it at a list of hosts that have SMB sign disabled. And we're going to. Um, the moment that we have uh, code execution, we're going to launch um, instructions to to the systems that um, to to pull our stager, which is very dangerous. <laughs> this is me on a pen test. <laughs> So here we're uh, spinning up our listeners um, and we're using HTTPS listener and we're going to use MS build as our stager. Um, the reason why I'm doing MS build is because it allows us to, to come effectively do an in, uh, like an in memory um, compilation of our payload um, and then it's executed. So nothing touches disk um, and in fact, um, it wasn't until recently that we uh, Microsoft started actually using uh, AMC to, to to look for for these types of attacks. And there, there's a lot of different AMC bypasses, but um, we're just generating a builder um, for using MS Build. And what you'll see here in our attack scenario is we've got NTLM Relay six, um, uh, NTL, NTL, NTLM Relay X running. Um, V6 uh, coupled with MITM6 and Responder, and we're effectively instructing a system um, to use MS Build to connect to this SMB shared and grab our stager and then 
compile and execute it. And as you can see, we're attacking, you know, every single target um, on our on our internal network that has SMB signing disabled. And the moment a user has admin privileges, um, they're going to be ex they're they're going to download our stager, compile it, and execute it. And we're getting shells with system privileges. And as you can see from the timestamps here, um, this is you know on this this internal pen test, I, I was able to pull up. 50, 60 shells within three seconds. Um, it was an absolute bloodbath. So um, it's a great success. <laughs> so um, once we get our shells, um, you know, I'm a big fan of, of Silent Trinity. Um, shout out to Byte Bleeder. Um, great tools that he produces. Um, Crack, Mac, Crack Map Exec is another one of my great tools. Uh, one of his one of his great tools that I love to use on my on my tests. Um, but over here we've got a um, AMC bypass, um, and what we're effectively doing is we're suspending Defender um, momentarily, so that way we can run Mimi Cats and obtain clear text credentials. And then, um, and you can see in the screenshot we're running on a 2012 server. Um, and then once we obtain um, the credentials, we're going to enable the AMC um, service. So. Um, highly, highly effective. And you're making Mimi cats great again. There's alternative methods as well. Um, donut, you can, you know, use uh, LSASI, uh, proc dump, anything really, but uh, just one of one of the quick, fun, easy ways of doing it. You mean the sound? Yes. I've been used I've not made sound for thousands of years. No, it's time, my friend. So, Danny, I make the sound. All right, so we have two minutes left. Um, I'm going to do as much as I can from the defensive side. Um, and we will post the slides. So, um, yeah, check, uh, I'm trying to check them out. Um, so first thing, infrastructure as code, um, either HashiCorp, Terraform, or AWS Platformation. Um, Terraform is on the left, Platformation on the right. Um, the biggest advantage that I see from that is, especially if you do daily scans or daily updates, you can see when things change. Um, if they're not in code and they changed, either someone changed it uh, manually a developer, which he shouldn't be able to do in terms of permissions, but um, it's great. Um, immutable infrastructure, um, HashiCorp Packer, you can bake AMIs and not start patching things. So you make a new AMI every time a new update or patch comes out and you deploy it um, across your um, infrastructure. Um, duplicating your cloud trail buckets to another account with a one-way sync. Um, great Medium article that shows how to do this. Um, even if someone gets root access to your account, he won't be able to delete it um, because it has the right only permission to write it to a bucket in a different account. Um, secret management, highly encouraged to use it. Don't hard code. Don't put things in environmental variables. Um, I use HashiCorp Vault, but AWS SSM Parameter Store is also great for that. Um, I like HashiCorp Vault because it does generate short-lived DB credentials. And I think we're out of time. So um, check out this list of open source tools. Um, highly recommend using them. And those two AWS services. And if we have time for questions, we can take questions. Right, I think we're out of time because we're kind of running a little bit, a couple of minutes behind. But um, we'll be taking a two minute break between sessions. But if you do have any questions, um, if Danny and Mo, if you want, maybe want to jump on the table um, and then people can find you and ask you any questions directly within the two minute break. Uh, or if you guys are around uh, for the rest of the day, that'll be great as well if you want to take any questions or talk through. There was a question around the slides which you answered, Danny, so that's fantastic. I think a lot of people are very interested in uh, in having a look at those. And I think that was pretty much it for the, for the questions anyway. But if you do have any, 
uh, these guys will, will, will hopefully be around for the next little bit. So thank you very much. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. And the more Zohan references, the better, in my opinion, in any presentation. So <laughs> very, very cool research and, and very, very cool hacking as well. It's always really nice to see. And I definitely appreciate live, live hacking and a live demo because it never goes well. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you for having